Wow. Wow. This is a great audience. I can't believe it. I'm, I'm in love with you guys. It's, it's dark and it's snowy and slushy and you're all here. So I'm totally in love. I just want you to know that. In a very platonic way, I just want you to know that also. I like you too. <laughs> I, uh, I just want to uh, introduce one of my favorite people in this series. This, uh, this is a series once a month where we have Harvard faculty scientists talk about what they're doing. And actually, last month, we had a, a lawyer. <laughs> uh, ta talking about what is evidence, which is pretty interesting. And, and all, of these, uh, all of these talks are online in the Harvard online world, uh, YouTube. Uh, and, and they're... And they're uh, they're not videotaped, they're recorded really well by our friend Fu here, and uh, they're worth watching in, in case you want to go back and, and, for instance, if you want to know anything about evidence, you could go back and watch Noah Feldman. Um, but I'm really excited to introduce uh, Professor Sarah Stewart, um, just because I like her, uh, and because she works on really interesting things. Um, she is a professor of Earth and planetary sciences here. <laughs> so she's, uh, she works in a building across the street. And um, she was an undergrad here. Uh, and uh, she claims, although I, I find this hard to believe that I taught her a class, uh, she said it, it was OK. <laughs> she was very involved with the theater, so she didn't really notice whether or not she learned anything. Um, but that was nice, and then after uh, getting her degree here, she went to Caltech, where she was a graduate student in planetary sciences, and she wowed them at Caltech, uh, which, is a, which is a pretty hard place to wow anybody. Um, and then she, uh, she did some other stuff, but what was more important that she came back here, and that was really nice, and uh, we were happy about that. Uh, Sarah was an assistant professor here, and then the John L. Lube associate professor of the natural sciences and then a full professor. Um, she works on pretty interesting things, but I guess from my point of view as an experimentalist, the coolest thing is she has a really big gun. Uh, apparently it's six meters long and it has a eight millimeter bore. Six? Forty millimeters. Forty? Oh, more. <laughs> Forty millimeter bore. And I guess she, what she does is she shoots stuff. And I guess, she, are you going to talk about this? Only a little. About your gun? I'm going to talk about her gun. Uh, we don't like guns, but uh, guns are terrible except when you're making shock waves with them because shock waves are very, very interesting, and, and that's what Sarah does. So for, if there's any kids in the audience, these are just shock wave guns, and your parents will tell you later tonight about shock waves. Um, is this okay so far? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not really very good, but it's, it's well known. <laughs> It's a known known <laughs> that the introductions are bad. Um, anyhow, uh, Sarah has been on NOVA, and you can see her on a NOVA called Finding Life Beyond Earth. So in case you can't get enough of her tonight, you can do that. She's also won a really fantastic prize from the American Astronomical Society called the Harold Urey Prize, which is a prize for the, like, the way best young planetary scientist. So that's very cool. So basically what we're doing here tonight is, uh, if I can stop talking, we're going to hear probably one of the world's experts on planetary science talk about uh, what she does. So here's Sarah. Thank you. Thank you for coming out in the snowy weather. So what Melissa was trying to explain was that I study what happens um, when planets collide, and I do that experimentally and using computer models, and at all scales, from small things hitting small things to planets hitting planets. And the story I'm going to focus on today is what happened when the moon was made. And this is still an open question in planetary science, and one that has had very interesting recent developments, so I thought it would be a good thing to give a public lecture on. So we'll start at the beginning of our solar system, during the formation of our star, around the star was a disk of dust and gas that we call the solar nebula. And in this disk, particles collided and grew into larger 
chunks of rock and ice that we call planetesimals. And these planetesimals basically have a, a solar chemical signature. That's our primitive or primordial chemical signature that we find in some of our least thermally processed uh, samples in the solar system. And as these planetesimals continued to grow, they heated up and uh, grew into larger bodies that we call protoplanets. And those, through their internal processing, generate a slightly different chemical signature. And as the gas around the sun dissipates, either by accreting onto the star or by being blown out um, or photoevaporated, the protoplanets collide with one another in the final stage of planet formation that we call the giant impact phase, where they grow into the final planets that we see today by a mix of protoplanets hitting protoplanets and planetesimals accreting onto these growing planets. And this giant impact phase is thought of as stochastic. And so the outcomes of these impacts are different depending on exactly which planet we're talking about. And the process of giant impacts and the differences in their outcomes are used to explain multiple observations in the solar system. And here are some of them. Mercury. These are radii, just to give you a sense of scale. So here's Earth's mean radius, the moon. Mercury has a very large iron core. On Earth, the iron core is about a third of the mass of the planet. And on Mercury, it's more than 60%. And that is unusual because the Earth has basically a, a, a solar ratio, or what we would expect to be the cosmic abundance ratio of iron to rock. And Mercury has much more iron compared to rock. And one explanation for that is that a giant impact stripped the rocky mantle off of Mercury. That is still an open question. Venus, our sister planet, rotates the wrong way um, from its orbit around the sun. And that is possibly the result of an impact that set its spin direction compared to Earth. Earth has a very large moon of these inner planets. It is the largest moon, and the two moons around Mars are basically the size of small asteroids. They're not substantial planets unto themselves. And Mars has a crustal dichotomy. The thickness of its crust is half as much in its northern hemisphere and the southern, as in its southern hemisphere. And one proposal for that is an impact that stripped off part of its crust. As we go to the outer solar system, Pluto has now at least five moons. Pluto is really a family where Pluto is the largest member of this family. And that is most likely the result of a collision that generated um, a, a debris field of bodies of various sizes. And Haumea is another icy dwarf planet in the outer solar system that has two moons. It spins near its spin stability limit. Its day is every four hours, and so it has this oblate cigar shape as well. And so giant impacts are invoked to explain the curiosities in the solar system. But they're everywhere in the solar system. And so we really should think of giant impacts as the, a natural component of planet formation, but one that can give us different flavors depending on where we happen to be and at what time we were in the solar system. And what I like to study is the physics of what happens during giant impacts. It is something that we don't have everyday experience with, thankfully, although we are, <laughs> it will be our last, right? <laughs> although um, we do detect signatures that we attribute to giant impacts going on in other planetary systems today. And so how should we think about giant impacts? We are guided very much by movies. And this is one of my favorite <laughs> analogs to a giant impact. So this is the industrial light and magic version of what could happen during an energetic event that could blow up a planet. Um, but let's turn to uh, a recent NASA version. So this came out a few years ago to explain a detection that was made around another star by the Spitzer Telescope, where they detected uh, vapor, rock vapor, essentially, and they attributed it to a recent giant impact. And so here's an animation of an impact, or an artist's conception based on 
what these particular scientists knew at the time. And so this impact is literally blowing the crust and vaporizing the crust off of the, one of these bodies. And the two bodies are merging in this particular impact. That doesn't have to happen. And we're left with a molten uh, planet that's melted from the energy that's been deposited in it. And in this case, uh, generated rock gas that was detected and dust that was detected uh, with a telescope. Now there's, I like this animation, so I'll play it again. <laughs> uh, it's, there are some physical inaccuracies with it, but the idea that uh, an impact can be so energetic that it can literally blow the surface off of a planet is something that's possible. More likely, uh, what happened in our own solar system as the planets were growing was that the planetary embryos had atmospheres and the shock wave that sent through the planet that leads to this ejection can eject of some or even all of planetary atmospheres or oceans if these bodies had oceans. In this case, what's missing in the physics is that the shock wave that would blow off the surface would pass through in the matter of minutes and the combination of the two bodies and the <clears throat> gravitational readjustment that occurs would take hours. So the animation isn't correct in its time scale and afterwards there would be a rock vapor atmosphere around these two bodies over their molten magma ocean surfaces. So there's a lot of interesting physics going on that we are trying to understand and to apply to the formation of the moon problem and to all of these quirks that we see in our own solar system. So giant impacts have these different outcomes. And here's an animation showing the cross sections through the terrestrial planets with Mercury's very large core. Venus has a similar a size core as the Earth, the moon has a tiny core. It's only about 3% the mass of the moon or so. And that's compared to the 30% for Earth. So compared to what we expect for the composition of planets, the moon has much less iron than we expect. And that is one of the observational clues about its origin. So the story of the Earth and the Moon that I'll tell today focuses on how we think the Moon formed. And one of the new flavors, the new aspects of studying the origin of the Moon is trying to understand what happened to the Earth as part of this process. And so I'll touch upon that at the end. So the first question you might be thinking is, don't we already know because we have textbooks that have the origin of the moon in them. And they explain that there is something called the giant impact hypothesis. It's been out for four decades or so. And it uh, posits that a Mars-sized protoplanet struck the growing Earth late in its formation and made a disk of debris that was mostly rock. And the moon accreted out of that disk, and that explained the large mass of our moon. Our moon is quite, is a two and a half percent of the Earth's mass. And it's small core because the debris was mostly rock. And the angular momentum of the Earth-Moon system, the spin, the, the Earth's day, and the orbital angular momentum of the moon. And it also explained an observation that we have from our rock samples that the moon itself is depleted in volatile elements. And by volatiles, I don't just mean things like water, but also elements that like to boil out of molten rock, like potassium and sodium. And so the hypothesis is captured in one of these simulations that these computer simulations that scientists do. This is the standard impact case as modeled by Robin Knupp. I'm just showing you here the proto-Earth, so about a 90% grown Earth, the Mars size impactor. Mars is a tenth the mass of the Earth. And you'll see colors, and the colors just denote the temperature range. So the, the magnitude is not important, except that this is a very energetic event. The hottest colors are boiling rock. And the projectile sheared and made spiral arms, moonlets form and are broken apart. Uh, in this disk, in this top-down view of the hot Earth with a hot rock atmosphere and a disk in a plane, if you were looking at it sideways, around the Earth 
and the moon grows out of that debris over some time. And this model, this hypothesis, has been considered rather successful, except for one problem that's been known basically since its inception. And the computer models that match the mass of the moon, the low iron content of the moon, and the angular momentum of the Earth-Moon system predict that the disk of debris originates primarily from the object that struck us. But over decades now, geochemists have been measuring lunar samples and Earth samples and found that the chemical signatures of the two are identical in a very special way and that the elemental isotopes of the two bodies are identical. And what that implies is that the Earth and the Moon were made from the same original material. And it is basically impossible that the impactor had the same isotopic fingerprint as the Earth. So I'll show you another animation that illustrates where the materials come from. <clears throat> In this case, this is the textbook scenario again. 90% grown Earth, a mars size impactor, a tenth the mass of the Earth. And this is a slice through the equator looking top down. So the colors just denote material, gray for the iron cores, and the green and the yellow for the rocky mantles. And we'll watch the impact. The impactor is sheared, the iron core is stretched out, material is torqued around the planet. Most of the iron from the impactor ends up in the Earth, and each time these blobs of iron impact, it heats up the Earth, melts part of its mantle, and generates this hot atmosphere. And we have clumps that get sheared apart. But most of the particles in orbit here in this simulation are yellow. They're from the body that struck us rather than from the Earth. And typically, about 70 to 80 percent of the material in the disk is from this other body. And it takes about a day for the uh, mass of the disk to settle down to be about twice the mass of the moon, and half of that material accretes and forms the moon, and the other half falls back down onto the Earth. How big a problem is the fact that the isotopes on the Earth and the moon are identical? What, what does that really mean? So different elements that end up in planetary bodies are tracking different processes that occur during planet formation. And these processes, there are different processes that can change the abundances of different isotopes, the same element but different number of neutrons in the atoms. And so for example, oxygen isotopes, oxygen is a volatile element, so it's quite mobile. It has large variations in the solar nebula, not all that we totally understand, but there are differences between every body that we have measured, between the meteorite groups that we measure, and oxygen isotopes are one of the first things that are measured to try and group different materials together. Titanium has identical isotopes between the Earth and the Moon. It is a refractory element, meaning it doesn't boil except at very high temperatures. And there are anomalies observed in different meteorites that are attributed to differences in nucleosynthetic production of different uh, isotopes that are implanted into the solar nebula. Tungsten isotopes include a radiogenic system with a very short half-life. Half and, and tungsten isotopes are changed during the process of core formation. The iron segregating into the center of the planet changes the abundances of the ratios of, of tungsten isotopes in the rocky mantles, and that generates a signal that depends on that planet's age, when the core formed. And so that is different for everybody. And so on. Variations in the solar nebula, refractory and volatile elements, even hydrogen is suggested to be identical in the Earth and the Moon in the sense that any, the little bit of hydrogen or water that ended up in the Moon, because it's not completely dry, um, has a similar isotopic signature as we have on Earth. And so collectively, 
this set of isotopes track so many different processes, processes that happen in the nebula that tell you where the material came from in the nebula, and processes that happen on the body themselves, that each individual protoplanet has a unique isotopic fingerprint. And so to argue that something that struck us had exactly the same set of isotopes for all these systems is to invoke a twin that we don't know how to make. So that is the explanation of last resort. <laughs> and, um, and, and it was, and it, it remained a conflict between the giant impact hypothesis and the data. There was a solution proposed, and it's quite a clever one. The giant impact heats material up. We have all this rock vapor. We have a hot disk. The disk itself is boiling. And what if material exchanged through the atmosphere of the Earth and the inner part of the disk, and then material exchanged along the disk, such that any chemical difference that existed between the disk and the Earth was mixed away before the moon formed. And <clears throat> this idea was put to a lot of scrutiny. And it's currently not favored as it was proposed because it has been contradicted by new measurements on the Earth that question how well mixed the Earth was during its formation. The titanium isotope data was a big problem because it's such a high temperature element that the disk would have had to have been very hot and stayed very hot in order to mix titanium isotopes. As the disk cooled by radiating energy away, uh, it would have fallen below the temperature where titanium wants to condense, and then it wouldn't have been mixed as evenly as is observed. And angular momentum is potentially a problem in that if material is exchanged, angular momentum would be exchanged, and the disk would fall down onto the Earth, and you wouldn't make a moon. So there are many issues with the idea of mixing. Some mixing probably occurred, but it doesn't seem like it's enough to explain isotopic identicality. And so this is where we were a year and a half ago. And it's important to remember that you should reject hypotheses if they don't stand up to the data, right? <laughs> this is an important step to consider. <clears throat> and the reason why it wasn't done is literally because there was no other answer. And so we, our favorite, we clung to our favorite hypothesis for dear life because we didn't have anything to turn to. The other options that existed for the origin of the moon included capture, which wouldn't explain the identical isotopes, co-formation with the Earth, which we couldn't explain. How do you form two bodies together at the same time, one orbiting another from the same source material? Um, and fission, which would require the Earth to be spinning so quickly that it somehow shed material to make the moon, but that process also was, didn't have a strong physical basis. And so while all of you were sleeping soundly at night, the planetary scientists were in a state of crisis. And it was a serious problem where there were many talks and many news articles read by scientists about how we, it was a big embarrassment that we couldn't explain the origin of the moon. So how do we deal with it? <clears throat> we go back to the, the observations that we were using to constrain the model for lunar origin. And now we have to put at the top of the list that the isotopes are the same. And so somehow we have to have the same source material end up in both bodies. We still have to make this large mass moon, which is a challenge. It's very few giant impacts create a moon as large as ours. The small iron core seems to be more straightforward in that the cores generally do want to accrete onto the Earth. We have angular momentum. We have a certain spin and a certain orbit for the moon, and we have to be able to reproduce that. And we have this lack of volatiles on the moon. That isn't directly explained by the physical models for moon formation, but it is an energetic event. It does vaporize rock, and so we put that in a plausible outcome box without modeling it directly. And when you look at this list, what would you take off? There's nothing that you can change. <laughs> you can't change the mass of the moon. We have no reason to think that it's changed with time. If we added mass to the moon but not the Earth, or added them in different proportions after we made the moon, then we would expect to change the isotopes, at least some of them. 
So the only thing on this list that we found that had any wiggle room was the idea of angular momentum conservation. Now, in physics class, <laughs> here in this lecture hall, <laughs> drilled into me that uh, angular momentum is conserved. This is not something we can wiggle our way around. We have to find a solution. And so the illustration, the standard illustration of the ice skater is that as she pulls in her arms, because the radius of the spin is changing, the velocity that she spins must change to compensate, to preserve this quantity of mass times velocity times <coughs> radius. And so is the same with the moon. The lunar orbit is moving outward slowly with time today. And the Earth's day is lengthening as a result. If we go backwards in time to when we think the moon was newly formed, the Earth's day was only five hours long. And the moon would be about three Earth radii away. It would be 20 times bigger in the sky. The, suns, the, you know, the, moon, the full moons would be gorgeous. <laughs> and, um, and that is the value that the models are matching to generate the moon, a post-impact Earth with about a five-hour day. And what we considered was what if, after the giant impact, the Earth was spinning faster, and the total angular momentum of the Earth-Moon system was larger than today. Now, we'll have to come back and answer how did we change the angular momentum of the Earth-Moon system. But for the moment, let's entertain the possibility that the, moon was, that the Earth was spinning quite quickly. And so if the goal is to make the moon out of the same material, there are two ways to do it if you're allowed to spin faster. And two have been proposed. Robin Knupp, who was the same person who helped develop the standard model for lunar origin, proposed that two approximately half Earth-sized bodies collided very slowly, merged, but did it at a grazing angle so that they both spun off material into the disk. And they both contributed equally to the disk as to the final planet. And so then the source material is the same, approximately half from each of the colliding bodies. My postdoc and I, Matya Chuk, and I proposed starting with a fully grown Earth, practically, that was spinning quickly already from a previous giant impact, and hitting it with a smaller body, half Mars or less, more quickly and more head on, and most of the debris from this type of impact actually originates from the fully grown Earth, and thus making the disk out of the Earth, as was the hope with the original giant impact model. So let's look at an animation of the fast-spinning Earth case. And here again, the colors will denote material. And I'm starting with a side view of the fast-spinning Earth. An Earth spinning near its spin stability limit, which is about a two-hour day, is very oblate, squashed, oops. And its equatorial axis is almost twice its polar axis. This is a dramatic state for a young planet. And in this animation, the projectiles often named Theia, coming in rather quickly, will we'll rotate so that we look at a slice through the planet. And again, the colors are just materials. The impactor penetrates all the way down to the core, opening an enormous cavity on one side of the planet, shedding debris that is torqued into orbit. And most of the debris are green dots, representing material from the proto-Earth. And it takes several hours for the Earth to gravitationally readjust after such an energetic event. Part of the Earth is vaporized. Part of the Earth is melted, but not all of it. And at the end, we have a hot extended rock atmosphere and a disk with enough angular momentum to remain in orbit. And this disk is mostly so material sourced from the Earth. But the material in the disk and the Earth are actually about equal proportions of projectile and uh, proto-Earth material. And so now we have taken. Uh, the original giant impact model, which had 70 to 80 percent difference between the disk, source material, and the Earth, 
to cases where we have a few percent difference, basically within the error of our ability to do these simulations. Bas and that would be one way to solve the chemistry problem with the identical isotopes. Now, these are simulations where the mass of the bodies are represented by particles with fixed mass. And we use conservation of energy and momentum and an equation of state, and we propagate these forward in time to calculate where these particles go. But I don't want you to have this view in your head of little balls of matter. This is really a boiling system with vapor and droplets surrounding the Earth. And so I'll show you the same animation, but contoured by density. And so the bluer colors will be less dense rock liquid vapor mixtures, and the red colors are the condensed hot um, cases. To give you a sense of the drama, now if I were a movie producer, I could add all sorts of texture layers to this, but you can see the iron core, the rock mantle, the vapor atmosphere, this is a cut through the equator again, and this disk, which would be droplets of rock and vapor, and if there were an ocean, there would be water vapor mixed into this mixture as well. And as this disk cooled, the droplets would settle out and we would begin the process of making the moon. And so if you had a front row view of this event, sadly, all you would see would be the cloud. You wouldn't see <laughs> anything else going on with the impact and deformation of the Earth. Now, the process of making the moon out of this disk is actually the least understood out of all of it. And as we go forward in our research, one of the goals will be to try and link the chemistry of what's going on to the process of making the moon from the disk. And that is a significant challenge in our field right now. A few months ago, there was a meeting at the Royal Society in London on the origin of the moon. And it seemed like we had made great progress, but also introduced such complexity to the problem that there were great challenges ahead of us in trying to link the geochemistry to the physical models. And so I'll discuss the accretion of the moon from the disk as a way of, of describing some of these problems, as well as what we know. So now this is a slice so if, uh, through the side. So top down, we have a disk around the oblate fast spinning Earth. And if we rotated and took a slice orthogonal to what you're looking at, we now have the spin axis up and down and the planet rotating in and out of the page. And it is elongated with its long axis compared to its polar axis. And there is a hot disk of bulk silicate earth, the rocky part of the earth composition in a disk around the hot atmosphere of the earth. And it's cooling, and there are processes within the disk that generate heat that keep it hot for some time. And, but it's gravitationally bound. We're talking about the, the material that's gravitationally bound. The Roche radius is the radius where a moon can be stable to tidal forces and won't get sheared apart. A moonlet within this will be sheared into smaller pieces and have to accrete again. And so the goal is to get moonlets accreting out of this disk torqued into orbits that are beyond the Roche radius. And so as this cools, the disk cools, droplets in the disk, rock droplets will literally rain down and settle into the midplane and there will be a gradient in temperature, and these particles will collide, and gravitational instabilities in the disk will clump them into moonlets, which could be 100 kilometers in size. Okay. These liquid droplets that are clumping, because they are the condensates in this hot vapor disk, they will be volatile depleted, and they will inherit a de volatile depleted signature in the moonlets that are growing into the moon beyond the Roche radius. This continues uh, 
until the material in the disk is depleted or the moon is torqued so far out that it ends up truncating the disk and isolating itself from the rest of the disk. And the disk itself is partially accreted onto the Earth. The remaining material in the disk that isn't accreted into the moon is accreted onto the Earth. And so the excess of volatiles that would have been the bulk Earth that didn't make it into the moon are actually added to the Earth, although it's such a small fraction that we don't notice. And the process of cooling, the time of cooling, could take hundreds of years. So the giant impact itself is the first few hours. So you can think of moon formation in the giant impact hypothesis as being an impact triggered event, and the impact itself is, is, a law, is, is certainly not enough to explain all of the process of moon formation. So these are cartoons. They're not even a computer simulation. There are very crude, actual computer models of the process of accreting the moon from the disk. And the challenge right now is to try and understand the physics there as well as linking in the chemistry to explain the volatile depletion quantitatively. And here we have an Earth spinning with a two to three hour day, the moon newly accreted some hundreds of years after the impact event, and now we have to solve our angular momentum problem. So we, we, we have angular momentum conservation, but we want to transfer it. And this poor person would like to transfer it by changing the length of day. But uh, we want to change the length of day, but we're going to do it through uh, a well-known mechanism called an orbital resonance. So orbital resonances occur often when the period of two things match. And they can, uh, through dynamical interactions, keep two bodies stuck in some kind of matched period. In this case, the name of the resonance is the evection resonance. And it occurs when the lunar orbit's closest point to the Earth, the perigee, becomes locked with respect to the sun so that the eccentric lunar orbit processes around the Earth with exactly a period of one year, equal to the orbit of the Earth around the sun. And so the orientation of the orbit becomes locked with respect to the sun. And during this resonance, it is possible to transfer angular momentum from the Earth-Moon system to the Earth-Sun system. And that's basically what we showed could happen in a, in a numerical calculation. And I have a animation of the evolution of the orbit as it gets caught in this resonance. So this is a top-down view of the Earth, shown schematically, and the lunar orbit just outside where it would have formed, just a little bit outside the Roche radius. The initial spin of the Earth is a two and a half hour day. The time of this animation is several tens of thousands of years. And we begin with almost double the angular momentum of the present day, and it will slowly drain away. So initially, tides, just like today, raise the lunar orbit until it reaches the resonance, and it gets caught in the resonance, which fixes the perigee point with respect to the sun. But tides are still transferring angular momentum to the moon, and so it keeps trying to raise its semi-major axis, although its orbit is locked in a certain configuration. And so it passes this angular momentum off to the sun, reducing the spin rate of the Earth, shrinking its semi-major axis, and at some point, the orbit shrinks so much that the resonance is broken because the amplitude of the tides decreases. And the moon now moves outward in standard tidal interaction that we have today. So over this time period, angular momentum was drained from the Earth-Moon system and transferred to the sun. Now, when my postdoc had this result. We were looking for a way to change angular momentum. Of course, the first question I asked was, any idea? <laughs> Why had nobody done this before, right? Why is it 2012 and, <laughs> and you're the first person who's shown this to anybody? And it's to give you a sense of how so much can happen in planet formation that we literally haven't thought of at all. 
that nobody had looked at the case of the fast spinning Earth with this level of detail to try and explain this exact problem. And that those who had, had looked a little bit here and there, but hadn't found it. And so some ways we were lucky in that we had found a solution that provided the magnitude of angular momentum transfer that we needed. And what, what we found were the tidal parameters that were needed to make it work. And now the community needs to investigate whether or not those tidal parameters are likely or will hold up under further scrutiny. And there are other resonances that are being investigated today that may end up working better than our first proposal. But now sort of the cat or the Pandora's box is open. We have the possibility of having a much faster spinning early Earth. We have multiple mechanisms that are being investigated to try and understand how to change the spin rate of the Earth. And hopefully they'll work out and stand the test of time. So here we are. We don't have just a giant impact. So when you go out, look up at the moon. <laughs> Appreciate that the existence of the moon is a multi-stage process that begins with a giant impact, goes through this black box of formation from a disk, and then a crucial part of this model is going through a resonance that slows the rotation rate of the Earth-Moon system. And if that happened, then we can explain the physical characteristics and the chemical characteristics of the Earth and the Moon. So the question we have today is, what do we do now? Am I going to give this talk again in a few years and say, oh, forget that model. <laughs> We're going to try a new one. And the model was proposed with two very different scenarios for making the Moon two half-Earths colliding, and then a small impactor hitting a fast-spinning Earth. And so the process that we're going through is the scientific process. We're trying to understand what predictions we can make from this scenario that we can use as a way of helping to verify it. We're trying to look at data that weren't part of the original constraints to see if we can explain other observations. If we could conduct the experiment, we would. We can do parts of the experiment, which I'll tell you about in a bit. And we can use more data to help us understand what's going on. So the testable predictions are to try and make our models better to understand what phase space we're talking about during planet formation. Not everything in the universe can happen in the giant impact stage. Some impacts are more probable than others. These impacts are possible but they're less probable than the original model of a mars size impactor. mars size protoplanets are the mean size that we expect the protoplanets to be. So now we're invoking something that's not the typical case. And so we're working through these questions of probabilities at this point in terms of forward modeling predictions. Now, I'll tell you about my favorite aspects of independent observations before ending, and that is the implications for the Earth and the volatiles on the Earth. And there are two aspects that we're looking at um, in, in my department. And the first is that the Earth itself has gases trapped in the solid Earth. And some of those gases have a chemical signature that date back to that solar nebula I started with at the beginning of the talk. And we call that a primordial gas signal. And the rest of the mantle, the more accessible part of the mantle, um, has a very different distinct signature. And they must have arisen independently and very early in Earth's history, during the period of planet formation. And one question is, how does that signal survive giant impacts? Don't giant impacts melt and mix the whole planet? And the second signal we're trying to explain is something about the details of Earth's volatile budget. And here I'll point out hydrogen and carbon and nitrogen. And on Earth, if you look at the ratio of these elements, the Earth has higher, carbon, higher hydrogen to carbon ratios um, compared to these primitive meteorites that we have from planet formation. And the way to interpret this is that we have more water to carbon dioxide, is one way to think about this, or more water to nitrogen gas um, which would be condensed as ices and meteorites 
And how do we explain the difference here? We, we probably didn't actually add more hydrogen to the Earth. What we did was, was lose some of these other gases. So let's talk about the mixing first. And I'll show you an animation of the alternate uh, scenario of two half-Earths. So here are the iron cores and the rocky mantles. And this is a case of making the moon equally out of the two cases. These simulations have no material strength. So this is a little bit of a disorienting uh, animation to me. But we have these two um, bodies collide that ge generate spiral arms of material. And instabilities in those spiral arms lead to <coughs> material being emplaced into the disk around the Earth. And the dash line here is the Roche radius. And beyond, this is where the moon will form. Now, if you get a sense of the dynamics over the hours of this event, there's a lot of mixing going on. And the question is, can an early gas signature survive in the mantle of this growing body or not? And that is still an open question, although there's certainly more mixing in this case compared to the smaller impactor on the fully grown Earth. And so here's just a, a color scheme to give you a sense of what happens. Here's a slice of the equators of the two bodies. <clears throat> and the colors just denote where they end up. So the yellow ends up in the atmosphere. Purple dots are distributed within this blob, and they end up in the disk. And the green are the lower mantle after the impact of event. And those originate from the far side from the impact, the bit that's least shocked and it's actually probably unmelted material. So we didn't melt the whole planet in this case. And if there were a special mm -hmm. gas signature trapped on the opposite side of the planet, it might survive. And this is something that we're investigating in more detail today. And this is one way, one avenue that we're trying to pursue to discriminate between different moon formation models. In terms of the volatile budget of the Earth, one of the things we'd like to explain is the difference between Earth and Venus. Earth is depleted in volatiles, depleted in, in atmosphere gases compared to Venus. And here we have this observation that we apparently have depleted the carbon and the nitrogen. What giant impacts can do, which the JPL animation alluded to at the beginning, was blow off some of the atmosphere. And when there is an ocean and an atmosphere, giant impacts blow off more gas compared to liquid water. And that's a way of preferentially losing carbon dioxide and nitrogen from the gas atmosphere of the growing Earth, but retaining uh, more of the water as condensed liquid water. The new high spin models blow off a significant fraction of the atmosphere, but the traditional model of moon formation does not. And so this is one other avenue that we're pursuing where a uh, high spin origin of the Earth and the Moon might explain an observation that heretofore had gone unexplained with regards to the chemistry of the Earth. And finally, well, two more things. The, we can reach all of the range of planet formation now in the laboratory. We can't collide two planets, but we can generate the pressures and the shock waves that occur in the regime of planet formation in the lab. And we can do that on different platforms. So this is a picture of my gun <laughs> in the basement of Hoffman. <clears throat> and we can reach modest shock pressures on a, a, this type of launch platform. You can reach pressures down to the core mantle boundary using different types of guns in the lab. But to get to the full range of planet formation, we need to go to national facilities like Lawrence Livermore National Labs National Ignition Facility, which is 192 lasers all focused down onto one point, and we can generate pressures in the center of hot Jupiter-type planets. And the Sandia Z machine is a big capacitor bank that discharges a current very quickly through a metal plate and can launch these plates up to 40 kilometers per second. So we can reach all of the impact velocities in planet formation in the lab, and we're trying to understand what happens to the planetary materials involved because the extent of melting and vaporization are key aspects to the growing of the planet and the origin of the moon problem. Finally, scientists want to go back to the moon. And we have a new uh, experiment on the moon. Last Saturday, the Chinese landed the Jade Rabbit rover. 
And it has uh, instruments like a ground penetrating radar and an X-ray spectrometer that will uh, give compositional information about the moon. But what people really want for origin of the moon questions is more information about the mantle chemistry on the moon. We have a lot of crustal samples and volcanic rocks, but we really have very poor constraints on the mantle composition. So there is more work to be done, and different uh, ideas have been proposed about missions that could give us this type of information. And so I'll close with the idea that there's a lot of interesting physics occurring during the origin of the moon. It's still an open question. We have very new ideas about how to pursue it, and we don't know what will happen. <laughs> so I'll end there. <laughs> No, I, I didn't get Are to you show upstairs? you. No, I do both. <laughs> I, do, no, I do. If I do anyone both. wants to ask a question, please um, come up to the microphone. Uh, have you figured out any probability for uh, the moon actually getting into some sort of resonance with the Earth? Um, in the model that we proposed, as we proposed it, so you can say, what Machichuk did, because he's the dynamicist, um, was he determined what tidal parameters for the Earth and the Moon were needed to get the maximum angular, angular momentum transfer out of the evection resonance. And it requires a certain range. And the range is small. <laughs> and so from a probability point of view, it's small. And the question is whether or not it's probable and that is something that we are, we're working on actually putting a range on that. It, it requires both the Earth and the Moon probably to be partially molten, which is a hard thing to calculate in terms of predicting what the tidal cues are. Yeah. And there's no way, there's no data or there's no other way to figure out, uh, you know, other evidence for what the spin rate of the Earth has been. Observationally, I, I don't know. The, the spin rates of all planets are things that can change through interactions in the solar system or getting trapped in resonances, and you just can't tell what happened before the resonance you were trapped in, in the, in the reverse model. And so, no. I think we're back to the, is this plausible and consistent with everything else we know in terms of, of modeling it? Yeah. Thanks. There are other resonances that might work. That are that are being pursued, but none of them are published yet. Yeah. Yes. Um, when we consider that the chemical makeup of the moon is so similar to that of the Earth that the matter of the moon must have come from the Earth rather than another object, and we consider those two hypotheses of two half Earths colliding or one small object colliding with a much larger object, can't we now conclude that the only interpretation is that it was a small object and the much larger one, and very little of the matter of the smaller object became part of the moon, so that we don't see any difference, really? Because you tend two half-Earths colliding with each other, you'd have to suppose that either they are coincidentally very similar, or somehow one of them contributed its mass to the, to the moon and the other one didn't. And well, in the, in the two half-Earth model, yeah. they contribute equally or proportionally to the amount in the growing planet. And so it's still a viable model. There isn't any uh, conclusion that's come out of that model to date that really excludes it from happening. So right now, it's, it's still being pursued as one of the alternatives for making the moon. But your earlier statement, though, is that the moon's consi consistency or constituency of, of isotopes and so forth mm -hmm. is so close to the Earth that we can right. rule out the possibility of a coincidence. That's and right. And so in the two half-Earth models, the yellows and the greens are equally in the growing planet and in the disk. And so then the isotopes would be mixed to some intermediate value between the two and look the same in the disk and in the Earth. So it has to be very close to half and half. It does. Yeah. So that, that is a narrow range of viability. 
and that is one of the issues with the model. But it's still, we just have to have it happen once. <laughs> so that's, so what, we have to entertain that one possibility. Okay, thank you. Young people who want to ask questions. <laughs> I don't mean young. I mean really young. Yes. <laughs> yes. Something like that. Thank you. Well, while we're waiting, um, do you do you need a collision at all? Is it possible to just have a, a drive-by, uh, a very close passage by a very large object? Yeah. To, um, to uh, draw off a tidal tail yeah. from the, from the uh, earth, so uh, the, one from of the your, soft earth. Yes, um, Willie Benz looked at this uh, in detail. In the sense, when the giant impact model was being proposed, uh, a tidal interaction was also investigated. But it's hard to get the mass and the angular momentum to match. The mass of what? The mass of the moon, to get enough material off of the Earth and in the right place at the right time. So it's been looked at. Mm -hmm. um, nothing came out of it that matched the observations. It's, it's hard to do. <laughs> OK. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> there you go. Do you think anything crashed into the mood while it was being made? Do I think what crashed into the moon? Did do you think anything crashed into the moon while it was being made? While it was being made, yes. Um, do do we think anything crashed into the moon while it was being made? So just like the planets grew by little planets colliding, the moon grew by little moonlets colliding as well, and so that's part of the process of growing planets. And then after we made in the moon, made the Earth in the moon, asteroids and comets have hit both of us. But not very much mass was added there, a fraction of a percent, probably. So the moon was very near the end of Earth's formation to its total mass today. It's a good question. Your version, the uh, the smaller body uh, hitting the the giant fast spinning Earth. Where does the small body come from? Was it part of the Earth or some something else that didn't matter right. whether it was whether it had been part of Earth right. because it was a complete mixture? So in all of the giant impact models, the impactor is a leftover protoplanet in the inner solar system, and one of the last to be eaten or thrown out. Then. Yeah. That's, that has a flavor of the earlier 2007 proposal of mixed, uh, what it's called, mixed after, the, the um, mixed after impact. There's still some similarity to that version. Is that, isn't that right? The impactor would be mixed in? Is that what you no, said? No, what you call mixed after impact, the, the 2007 proposal. Oh, yes, the post-impact, yeah. right, the disk and the atmosphere right, mixing. Right. There, there's much similarity between your version and that, that revision of the, um, the earlier. The, so, the the, so, so one of the things that came up in this conference a few months ago was, are we missing a step? Are we missing something that happens in all giant impacts that we don't recognize yet? And one example was this equilibration process between the Earth and the disk. Does that happen universally? Does it happen to some amplitude all the time? And then we wouldn't, it wouldn't matter what the impactor was. But that doesn't, the, the physics of that doesn't seem to be holding up under scrutiny in terms of reaching the equilibration that we need. So the, so what we're trying to do still is to minimize the chemical signature of the impactor or to make it contribute equally, essentially. How about speculations of moon formation uh, on other planets, such as uh, Saturn, or do they follow the same? Right, so moon formation on, around the giant planets is right. thought to occur in a planetary disk around the gas giants. And that process is, is different. 
it's more, it's a more massive disk, it's more extended, it makes multiple moons. Um, and then people are pursuing an impact origin for the Mars moons, which are quite small. It's an open question whether they don't appear to be captured or it, there isn't a simple capture explanation as, that, as far as I understand it based on their chemistry. And then the, the outer solar system, Pluto and Haumea and other dwarf planets, they do seem to be the result of collisions, but different style collisions that make families of bodies rather than just a binary. Yeah. So let's have one last question here, <coughs> and then afterwards I'm sure that Sarah would be happy to answer questions. Mm -hmm. So I have a question about uh, something you talked about a little earlier where you said how the, uh, there's an orbital resonance reached between in the moon's orbit around the Earth and then you have angular momentum that's transferred to the Earth-Sun system, but then that orbital resonance is broken eventually. So I was a little unclear as to what happens after it's broken. Is this a cyclic thing that would, it would get into another orbital resonance, and how would that right. affect the slowing of the Earth's right. spin? Right, so, so dynamicists have mapped out all the resonances they could find in the lunar orbit, including ones with giant planets and things like that. Those are much weaker in amplitude, in the sense that uh, some resonances exist, but the moon might not get caught in them or might move through it rather quickly, and it doesn't change the standard lunar orbit very much. If, for example, the tidal parameters were not the special tidal parameters for the evection resonance, then the moon would get caught in evection but get kicked out of it again very quickly, and we wouldn't slow the Earth's day as much as we needed. The evection resonance occurs at a certain radius from the Earth. Its position depends on the, how squashed the Earth is, but it's just that one location. So once you pass it, it's done. It doesn't play any more role in, moon, in the moon's orbit, but other weak resonances are encountered, but they don't do much to the moon's orbit. So let's thank Professor Stewart again for <laughs>